Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dom Wright. I'm a senior investment manager at Henderson Row, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our second virtual investor lunch. I'm joined today by Dr. Phil Wool, head of Henderson Rose Investment Committee and head of investment solutions at Radiant, who's calling in from California. Good morning to you, Phil. Hey, Dom. Uh, I should point out that this event is being recorded, and so by joining us today, you can send it. I read the other day that the way to get around any potential Christmas COVID restrictions is to host a funeral for the turkey. That way, you can invite up to 30 guests along as mourners. Sadly, even with that wheeze, we're not able to host all 80 of you in person today, but we're looking forward to the day when we can. Over the course of the last seven months, we have all had to adapt to new ways of working. My investment manager colleagues have responded with tenacity and an enterprising spirit, and we've had more new client meetings over the last six months than ever before, either on Zoom, over an alfresco lunch, on a bike ride, or over a round of golf. What's not changed is the tremendous support we get from Radiant, and together our focus remains to always look for improvements in our research that can generate marginal gains. In July, our director and head of operations, Anna Diaz, was recognised by Management Today and Accenture as one of the top young women in UK business, and under her leadership, we continue to invest in our internal systems to improve client service levels. And it's been inspiring to hear from our clients the ways in which you're looking for opportunities in your own businesses, despite these difficult times. I'd like to quickly run through the agenda and some housekeeping for today's event. At previous investor lunches, we've showcased charities that our clients or colleagues are involved with. And today, we're delighted to share with you a brief video from Save the Rhino International. They work to conserve all five rhino species by supporting conservation programs across Africa and Asia. And if you've run the London Marathon over the last 30 years, you might have spotted one of their iconic rhino costumes along the course. Then Phil will give us his thoughts on investing in uncertain times. Trump, COVID and Brexit is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. So I'm looking forward to hearing Phil give us the institutional perspective on these uncertainties. Finally, I'll put questions to Phil that we've sourced from you. Just in case President Trump turns up and starts talking over both of us, we've taken the precaution of muting all of you today. Whilst that avoids background noises, it also means that no one can ask um, spur of the moment questions. So if you'd like to continue the discussion with Phil, please get in touch with your investment manager and they will gladly set up a call. We'll finish just before three o'clock. So without further ado, I'll introduce you to Save the Rhino International. Hello to you all, and thank you for that kind introduction. I'm Michaela, the Partnerships Manager at Save the Rhino International, and this is John, our Deputy Director. Hello. We're delighted to have the opportunity to share with you today a couple of stories that might give you a glimpse into our world of rhino conservation. To begin with, we'd like to introduce you to two remarkable young women, Gift Mbalishi and Joyce Chiluba. Gift and Joyce play really important roles in conservation efforts in North Luangwa National Park, home to the only population of black rhinos in Zambia. Gift is 28 years old. She's really hard working and has become one of the first female dog handlers in an anti-poaching dog unit in Zambia. Joyce is 25 years old and she is a wildlife police officer and a certified master dog handler. She learns really fast and puts a huge effort into everything she does. The dog team is a game changer. With their incredible sense of smell, dogs can track scent after a poaching incident or sniff out rhino horn at key locations, finding and stopping wildlife traffickers in their tracks. Since 2016, thanks to Joyce, Gift and the rest of the team, there have been 500 arrests and the K9 unit has become one of the most effective wildlife crime fighters in Zambia. People like Gift and Joyce give us real hope that rhinos can thrive in the wild. Back in the 1960s, Zambia had the third largest population of black rhinos in Africa. 30 years later, that entire population had been wiped out by poachers. Rhinos were reintroduced to North Luangwa in 2003. And today, the National Park protects a precious group of black rhinos, still the only population in Zambia. At Save the Rhino, We've supported the work at North Luangwa for many years, promoting conservation and engaging and educating people who live around the National Park. Mm -hmm. 
We're looking forward to seeing Joyce and Gift this year to run in their London Marathon team in April. Obviously, sadly, that wasn't possible. So instead, both Gift and Joyce completed a virtual marathon in Zambia. Hopefully, we'll see them in London again in October next year. So our second story takes us from Africa to Asia and concerns a young man. Not a human this time, but a Sumatran rhino. Andalus was born in Cincinnati Zoo and was the first Sumatran rhino to be born in captivity in over 100 years. Sumatran rhinos are the smallest of all rhinos. They're covered in hair and they sing to find each other in the dense Indonesian jungle. Tragically, historic poaching and more recent habitat loss have reduced the global population to fewer than 80 animals, isolated in fragments of remaining rainforest amid the oil palm plantations. To ensure the future of this critically endangered species, a sanctuary was built to bring together the few remaining Sumatran rhinos living in captivity in zoos or in fragmented wild habitats. So young Andalus flew halfway around the world, back to his native Sumatra, where at the sanctuary he met a young woman called Ratu. Andalus and Ratu have two beautiful children. There's a boy named Andatu and a girl named Delilah. And while that's a happy story, and Andatu and Delilah are the only Sumatran rhinos born at the sanctuary to date. Today they're both almost fully grown and ready to find mates of their own. But there are so few Sumatran rhinos left in the world that at the moment there are no mates around to hear their songs. To bring the Sumatran rhinos back from the edge of extinction, a major conservation initiative, the Sumatran Rhino Rescue, was launched to find the remaining Sumatran rhinos and rescue them into safe sanctuaries where they will be protecting and able to grow their numbers. Save the Rhino is a strategic partner on this project, working alongside organisations like National Geographic and WWF to save these beautiful animals. And more widely, we work with partners in Africa and Asia and elsewhere in the world to end the poaching of rhinos, to stop illegal markets for rhino horn and to protect and grow safe habitats for rhinos and the many other species that live alongside them. We carry out our work against the backdrop of climate change, of massive biodiversity and habitat loss, and of course, a rise in diseases that have jumped the species barrier to humans. In these rapidly changing times, our work to protect healthy wild places and diverse wildlife is vital. Nature has to thrive if people are to thrive, and we need all the help we can get. So please, if you feel the same way, come with us on this journey and work with us to make sure the future generation can also share the wonder of iconic rhinos thriving in the wild. Thank you for giving us your time today and please do get in touch with us if you want to talk more. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Great. Well, if you'd like to learn more about Save the Rhino, we'd be delighted to put you in touch with our team afterwards. Uh, a black swan event is one that is severe in nature, but is so rare that it's impossible to predict. In the same vein, a grey rhino event is one that is both highly probable and will have a high impact, but the risks have been neglected. Here's Phil to talk about three of the biggest grey rhinos currently charging at financial markets. Thanks, Dom. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk with everybody, and I'm, I'm happy to see lots of familiar faces here. Um, I want to talk about these events that Dom mentioned, uh, COVID, Brexit, and Trump. But I think before that, I'd like to set the stage and spend some time talking about how our research and how our investment approach copes with new information and copes with news uh, at, at sort of a, an investment philosophy level. Uh, and, and that relates to both company-specific news, uh, but also these major market moving events that we want to talk about. Uh, and I want to discuss two dimensions of the investment approach and how each of those copes with new information. The first is something that we refer to as selection. And selection is about within an asset class, how do we pick the best investments? So how do we choose one stock versus another stock? And the other element of the process that I want to talk about is timing. And timing is more about when a big event happens, how does one change your overall asset allocation? So starting with selection, uh, how do we cope with news? And I, you know, when we refer to news, we're thinking about uh, company-specific news, 
uh, things like earnings reports, which are pretty standard, but also big announcements. Uh, so things like uh, mergers or uh, resignation of a company's CEO. We've also got macroeconomic data that's constantly coming in. And again, that can be routine. It can be something like GDP figures, uh, but it could be big events like a presidential election or like the Brexit referendum. Now, when we think about how news affects markets, it's sometimes useful to have kind of a baseline. And the baseline model that we use is an efficient market. In an efficient market, all prices incorporate all available information about all the assets in the market. And in an efficient market, as an investor, when new information comes in, there's really not much for us to do. So if there's an antitrust lawsuit against Alphabet, which is Google's parent company, uh, the price is going to drop immediately to reflect the damage that investors expect that antitrust lawsuit is going to do to Alphabet's earnings. But when we study investor behavior, and for those of you who have been to one of these investor lunches before, uh, you'll know that we often think about things in terms of investment behavior because that's what guides our, our investment process and it guides our research. Um, investors don't, of course, respond perfectly or instantaneously to news. And if you look at what investors do, you'll find that very often they overreact to news. And you'll find that investors sometimes react to non-news. And often they'll have a delayed reaction to news because they've got limited attention or they're not paying attention to the right things. So today we're going to focus on big news events. Uh, so uh, you know, when we talk about COVID or the presidential election, these are big events that are going to move markets. And when it comes to big events, uh, one of the things that we know is that they exert an undue influence on investors' decision making. And there's a, a study that illustrates this pretty nicely, and it's, it's kind of a morbid study, but basically these researchers were looking at, uh, they, they wanted to try, try to find particularly salient events, and they looked at plane crashes. And they found uh, that in the case of aviation disasters, investors had a big response. The first thing they did, though, they wanted to see what's the fundamental effect of an aviation disaster. And so they tried to estimate what's the economic loss associated with a big plane crash where you've got lots of loss of life. And what they found when they looked at insurers' losses and they looked at what the losses were like for airlines in terms of lost business and compensation that they had to make to victims' families, and they looked at uh, the, the loss to manufacturers, so aerospace companies and all of the companies that make parts for airplanes, they found uh, with some really rigorous estimates of those costs that the average large aviation disaster amounted to about a billion dollars worth of losses. But then they looked at the market response to a plane crash and they found that on the day that a plane crash hit the news, the market's response was on the order on average of about $60 billion in losses. And interestingly, and this is kind of what we expect to see if investors have misreacted to news, after the market reaction, you tend to see a reversal. So what they found is that most of that $60 billion of market value that was wiped out was actually reversed within the next few days. And there's plenty of evidence. You know, plane crashes, that's one example, and we're targeting news that is particularly salient, but there are plenty of other examples like that. So knowing that investors tend to misreact to information, especially when the news is, is news that really hits people's emotions hard, the question is how do we address that in terms of our portfolios? And with respect to selection, uh, the key is to acknowledge that we're not really trying to predict the occurrence of these big events. You know, Often that's difficult, if not impossible to do, but it's more about making sure that when we respond, that we do it rationally, and on top of that, that when we see other investors misreacting to news, uh, that we act to position our portfolio so that we can exploit the mistakes that they make and the mispricings that they create. So on the quantitative side, uh, the way that we do this is by building models that not only look at prices, because price is going to tell us how investors have reacted. Are they being pessimistic or optimistic in response to some information? But we also look at fundamentals. So our models incorporate measures of 
how analysts are responding. So how do rational actors in the financial community view the information that's coming through? How are companies' financials responding to news? And by comparing the price with the fundamentals, we're able to determine whether prices have moved in the wrong direction, and if so, by how much. And we can position our portfolio accordingly. On top of that, we have human analysts looking at the news and looking at the portfolio. So having a fundamental review of stocks and having someone looking at the implications of COVID-19 and what sorts of trends we think that's gonna usher in in terms of economic growth or in terms of how it's gonna affect different industries, that's something that we can incorporate uh, when we analyze individual stocks and determine how those are gonna fit into the portfolio. So that's stock selection. The other element, timing, uh, this is how most investors think about the arrival of news. So most investors, when there's a big event in the market, they think about how they're going to make big changes to their portfolio in response to that event. And often that's about a massive shift in their asset allocation. So there's a big piece of negative economic news that comes through and investors think about going to cash and kind of waiting it out. And it turns out there's a lot of research that suggests while stock selection is actually pretty straightforward if you've got the right models, market timing is extremely hard to do. And I want to discuss that challenge in the context of something that everybody's talking about right now in the U.S., which is, of course, the upcoming election. And there's another nice study, uh, and this study was done a few years ago. They wanted to look at how the market responds to presidential elections. And they went all the way back to 1880 because they wanted to have a big sample of presidential elections. And in particular, they wanted to know what happens when there's a surprising outcome in an election, because that's when you're gonna get the most interesting market response. And to figure out what sort of election outcome reflects a surprise and something unexpected, they went to data that we've got on betting markets associated with presidential elections. So it turns out even as far back as 1880, we have data on bets that investors were making on the outcome of elections. Of course, now we've got electronic election betting markets and you can go to the bookie and make a bet on the election. But in the 1880s, there was actually a betting market outside the New York Stock Exchange. So there were people on the corner making bets and taking bets on presidential elections. And all of those bets, the odds were actually published in the newspaper at the time. So there's a really long history of data. And so these researchers were able to figure out which were the most surprising election outcomes and how did the market respond? And what they found, they called it the Republican premium. They found that the market tended to respond very favorably when a Republican was unexpectedly elected president. So the question as investors is, can we use this information? So could we design a strategy uh, that accounts for um, you know, this, this knowledge that Republicans apparently, according to the market, are better for business and better for the economy and better for investors. And this is where things get kind of interesting. So Invesco did some simulations and they looked at different strategies related uh, to which party was in office. So this is how one responds to information. Once we know who's been elected president, how can we use that information to build a portfolio? And they also went back to the 1800s. So they started in 1896. That's when the Dow Jones Industrial Average launched. And they, they, they first asked, what would happen if you put $100 into the Dow Jones uh, in 1896 and you just held it for 120 years? What would that be worth in 2020? And they found that $100 would have grown to about 70,000 US dollars over that period, which is obviously a phenomenal return. Then they looked at what would happen if you only invested in the stock market when a Republican was in office. And they found that that same $100 invested in 1896 would only have grown to about $1,500 uh, by the end of 2020, or by the, 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 I guess, June 2020. Then they looked at Democrats and they found interestingly, and this is sort of contrary to the market's initial response, if you put $100 in the market in 1896 and you took it out whenever a Republican was in office, that $100 would grow to about $4,000 uh, by 2020, which is more than you'd see if you played the Republican strategy, but it's still 18 times less than what you'd have if you just took a buy and hold approach. Now they tested another strategy and this one is a, a bit less extreme. So this one is gonna keep you fully invested most of the time, but this strategy is gonna take your money out of the stock market during the first 100 days of every new administration. So the idea is 
There's a bit of uncertainty when someone new enters office. What if we just took our money out and just kind of sat in cash until we knew what was going on and then we put our money back into the market? And that strategy, they started their test in 1957. That's when the S&P 500 index launched. And they found that if you put $100 in the S&P in 1957 and you just held it for 60 years and didn't do anything, that would grow to about $8,000. But if you took this approach of taking your money out during the first 100 days of a new administration, uh, it turns out you'd only have $4,300 at the end of that 60-year period. So just about uh, half as much as you'd have if you played this buy and hold strategy. And again, you know, this is one example. How does the market respond to elections and how can we use uh, political parties and who's in the White House to determine asset allocation? But there are plenty of other examples that market timing is just really difficult. And so the approach that we take and when we describe how our models are built, um, we try not to time the market. Rather, we like to stay fully invested so that you can benefit from the long-term growth in the stock market and other asset classes. And instead, we're gonna focus more on selection because we know that selection allows us to avoid mistakes, but also to capitalize on the mistakes of other investors while maintaining that constant exposure so we can participate in economic growth. So that's kind of a, a description of our overall philosophy in terms of how our models and how our portfolio construction process is gonna adapt to new information as it's arriving. Uh, in, in terms of these three events that we talked about in the invitation that Dom mentioned in the intro, uh, I, I do want to talk about those. And now that you see how our process works, it'll probably be a bit clearer how we think about these, these types of news events. So first, COVID. I, I think COVID is probably the easiest of the three. Uh, it's clear that if you look at new case counts in the U.S. or Europe, uh, this is an issue that's going to be with us uh, for some time yet. And uh, that goes for the public health issue, but also the economic implications of COVID-19. Now, we've talked a lot about this uh, at previous investor lunches and in the quarterly notes that we put out, uh, and I think our advice remains the same. In terms of things you can do to protect yourself as an investor from COVID-19, the two most important things, one, don't panic and remain fully diversified. We found diversification, you know, you want to have uh, exposure to a broad set of asset classes, geographies, industries. That's the best way to kind of smooth out uh, the, the ride that you experience as an investor through a turbulent market. And the other thing that's really important, and this gets to uh, the question of selection, is when we see markets disrupted as they have been from COVID-19, one of the things we've witnessed is big changes in price. And we've seen lots of stocks fall in price substantially. Uh, and, and the key for us is don't just pay attention to the price, uh, but in keeping with what I described in terms of looking at the price and the fundamentals, you really need to focus on quality at a time like this. And so looking at the UK market, for example, which has been disproportionately hurt by COVID-19, um, you'll see lots of stocks. In fact, uh, the market overall looks like a bargain right now. But what you recognize when you start digging into the financials, and this is exactly what our quantitative models and our fundamental research are designed to do, you see that a lot of these companies are actually cheap for a reason, and some of them won't survive COVID-19. And so it's really important to look not just at whether a valuation is attractive or not, but whether the financials are there to back up an investment in a company. So that's sort of how we view COVID in a nutshell. In terms of Brexit, that gets a lot more complicated. And, you know, over the last week, there's been a lot of volatility and new developments. And this is uh, one of those events that's sort of characteristically unpredictable. Um, one thing we do know is that Brexit uncertainty has weighed on UK markets for a long time. So that goes for the currency, certainly, and also the stock market. And I think the, the, the other thing that's, that's probably a certainty is if there's any kind of a deal that's going to be good news for the pound. Um, what happens in the stock market is a different story. So there, uh, there's a lot more going on uh, and you sort of have arguments on both sides. Um, you know, one example would be the fact that a lot of the biggest companies in the UK, certainly a lot of components of the FTSE 100, uh, these are companies that have lots of revenues coming from overseas. And so if there's no deal and there's a weaker pound, that's going to be good for those companies repatriating those foreign revenues. 
On the other hand, we know that the general uncertainty associated with a no deal and all the problems that's going to create for trade, that's going to be a negative for stocks. And so uh, it, it's something of a toss up and talking to different experts, you'll get different views on what's going to happen uh, with the stock market in the case of Brexit. But again, this is where we would fall back more on security selection. And we would look at Brexit, not from a market perspective. Uh, you know, we think the UK market's going to do fine over longer horizons, but we'll look at it at an industry perspective. And we'll look at it at the individual stock level. And looking at individual companies' exposure to Brexit risk, that's one element, but, but obviously an important element of the way that our fundamental review tackles individual stocks. And the third event that we talk about uh, is the U.S. presidential election. And this is another one that's it, it's sort of clear cut in the sense that right now, if you look at those betting markets that I referenced before, Biden is predicted to win with about 90 percent probability at the moment. A blue wave or a, a Democratic sweep, that's actually at this point got a probability of about 75 percent, according to the odds makers and all of these people placing bets on these events. Um, if, uh, if the expected happens and Democrats take control of everything, uh, the expectation is that there's going to be a lot more fiscal stimulus, that it's going to be paid for uh, with increased taxes, and that we can expect a lot more regulation, um, you know, which will be good uh, for certain segments of, of, of the U.S. Uh, in terms of maybe environmental protections and uh, you know, a different distribution of income. But obviously, those things are going to be harmful for economic growth. Uh, and so markets won't like that very much. On the other hand, uh, one of the things we expect if Biden's elected is that uh, the U.S. trade policy is probably going to become a bit more sensible. Uh, relations with China will probably be a little bit better. And there's less risk that Trump is going to start a trade war with Europe at some point in the next year. So uh, a Biden presidency kind of has its pros and cons. But the important thing to note is that the market has already priced in Biden winning the election uh, with 90 percent probability. And so if Biden is, in fact, elected, we wouldn't expect that the market's going to have a huge reaction to that. The bigger reaction would be if Trump surprisingly wins. And he's done that before, uh, in which case we'd probably expect that in the short run, the stock market's going to go up a bit because it's, it's sort of viewed that Trump is going to be better for business, that uh, we'll continue to see deregulation, lower taxes. Um, and, and so uh, those are sort of the potential outcomes with respect to the U.S. election. So, uh, you know, kind of brief comments on these three events, but hopefully the extensive discussion of how we view news in general gives you a better idea as to what to expect from our investment process. Um, and, and I hope that it's sort of comforting to know that the way that we respond to news and the way that we respond uh, to some of these uh, emotionally charged events that are happening in the world and seem to be happening with increased frequency, uh, that's a very rational and systematic process. Uh, the upshot is that you're not going to have much excitement or drama in your investment portfolio. But if you're anything like me, uh, that, that's one place that you probably don't want to have too much drama. So. Uh, that's all I've prepared to talk about, and I, I, I know we've got some questions, so I'll hand it back to Dom uh, to, to hand those over. Uh, hi, Phil. Thank you very much for your thoughts there. Um, and yeah, I think you're quite right. We probably don't need any more drama um, this year. Probably seen enough of that uh, so far in 2020 so far. Um, so, Phil, you spend most of your time um, sort of doing research or talking to sovereign wealth funds and sort of government pension funds. So really good to hear a sort of non-emotional sort of um, dispassionate um, sort of perspective I guess on some of the world events uh, which is really useful. Um, so moving on to our questions, um, first one is a sort of two-part one um, from two different clients. So um, first is from uh, Jeff Batson who asks, um, depending on the outcome of the US election, how do you think the dollar will perform and how do you generally deal with the effect of currency movements in your portfolios? Um, and then the second part of that is sort of tangential um, from David Smith. And he asks, what are the implications of a Biden administration on global trade and economic relations between the US and China? OK, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll take the second part of the question first. So I think I, I, I kind of alluded to this before. Um, if Biden's elected, the, the general consensus is that uh, trade policies will become uh, more predictable, certainly, uh, 
um, and that with respect to China in particular, uh, that you know there there isn't going to be an immediate thawing of tensions between the U.S. and China. There are a lot of a lot of sort of structural issues in that relationship that transcend politics, uh, and, and so you know the the view is that Biden is not necessarily going to be soft on China, um, but that there will be a de-escalation and probably a, a more stable path uh, to, to some kind of a, a sustainable trade deal with China. So, um, you know, I think Biden overall is going to be better for global trade than Trump would be. So less, uh, less protectionism and, and, you know, more of the free trade that we usually kind of expect of a Republican administration. Um, in terms of the effect of a Biden or a Trump presidency on the dollar, uh, you know, it, maybe it makes sense to focus on Biden since he's uh, the, the one most likely to, to take office in January. Um, if Biden is elected, uh, I already mentioned, you know, there's going to be more stimulus, there are going to be higher taxes, uh, generally anything that's seen to slow growth in the U.S. Uh, is probably going to result in a weaker dollar. Um, if relations with China get better, uh, and there's less of a protectionist slant to U.S. trade policy, that would also generally favor a weaker dollar. So the consensus is that uh, a Biden presidency would result in a weaker dollar. But honestly, the biggest driver right now of a weak dollar is the Fed's rock bottom interest rate policy. So as long as rates are super low in the U.S., uh, we can expect over the medium term that the dollar is probably going to continue to be pretty weak. Good stuff. Thanks very much for that, Bill. Um, another US uh, question um, from Bill Johnston. Uh, according to the polls, Joe Biden will win the presidential election on 3rd of November. Biden is 77 and will be 81 at the end of his presidency. It's unlikely that he'll run for a second term. His running mate is Kamala Harris. Um, and in the unlikely event of Biden's demise or Kamala runs instead, what would be the impact on the market? Uh, in other words, what does she stand for politically as very little has been written about her over there? So it, it's it's a good question. Typically in a in a presidential election, the, the identity of the vice president is kind of inconsequential, but clearly with the age of both of these candidates, it's something that people are spending more time thinking about. Um, I, I think with respect to Kamala Harris, you know, she, she's been in politics, so we, we've got a, a bit of a record for her, and she presided over a, a booming economy in California. Um, so, so I think that's a positive in the sense that, um, at least at the state level, she wasn't interfering much in economic affairs. Um, there, on, on the flip side, I, I remember from the Democratic primaries that uh, one of her platforms was health care for all, and she wanted to pay for it by putting taxes on financial transactions. And so, uh, you know, definitely in terms of regulation, I think that could be a potential negative for Wall Street if she winds up dictating uh, U.S. financial policy. Um, that maybe the, the best indication of how the market feels about Kamala Harris is how it responded when she was uh, chosen as Biden's running mate. So the market response there was very positive, And that was because the alternatives uh, were running mates that had a much more extreme economic position. So you know, certainly the market is more favorable to Kamala Harris than it would have been to Elizabeth Warren. Uh, and I think generally she's viewed as much more moderate in terms of uh, expected economic policies and impact on financial markets. Good stuff. But, and, and presumably she's your local senator at the moment in California. Or one of yeah, two. exactly. Um, yeah. um, uh, excellent. So question three is from Peter Campbell. Um, and he asks, how do you decide when to sell a poorly performing asset and cut your losses? Uh, and conversely, how do you decide when to sell a well-performing asset and take the profit? Okay, yeah, so that it's it's kind of related to the discussion of stock selection. And um, as, as, as far as I'm concerned, I think, you know, the key in terms of buy and sell discipline is that you've got a structured process. So uh, it's, it's helpful that we've got fundamental research that's always monitoring the portfolio and looking for big changes um, to any of the names that we hold. 
um, you know, having a, a formal investment committee and a formal process for approving changes to the portfolio, I think that's important. Um, but in terms of how we make buy and sell decisions, you know, that starts with the quantitative models that we use. So it's a scientific data-driven process and already alluded to some of the inputs to the model. So we have to look at price, obviously, because it tells us how the market's reacting. It tells us how much a stock has run up or how much a stock has declined in relation uh, to, to what's happening in terms of the fundamentals. And then we're looking at all of these other inputs. So we're looking at sentiment, we're looking at growth, um, you know, we're looking at the, the quality of a company's financials, we're looking at how the management team is behaving, and all of those things, uh, they, they inform us as to how much fundamentals have changed. So are fundamentals improving? Are they deteriorating? And when we compare price to fundamentals, that's really the best way to determine when we should sell a stock. You know, if the price has increased to the point that relative to the fundamentals, it's no longer an attractive opportunity, that's a great time to sell. One of the mistakes that investors make is that they see price increase and they tend to sell their winners too early. So we'd wait until what we think is the good news about a company is fully incorporated into prices before we sell. Likewise, uh, and this is something else I've talked about at previous lunches, one of the principal behavioral mistakes that we recognize on the part of individual investors is that they tend to hold on to their losing stocks for far too long. And so again, that's where it's important to recognize that if the price drops, a stock may look a lot cheaper, but you've got to constantly be looking at the fundamentals to determine, you know, maybe the financial picture for that company uh, has declined to the point that even at a low price, it's no longer uh, a worthy constituent of the portfolio. So um, buy and sell decisions, they start with this systematic process, you know, looking at all of these inputs to the model, but then there's a human element to determine, you know, whether the model, what the model saying makes sense. And finally, there's oversight in terms of the governance of the way that the portfolios are managed. And so it's a, it, it, it's a, a rigorous process, but I think it produces the best outcome in terms of uh, these buy and sell decisions. Excellent. Thanks very much, Bill. I think that was uh, very clear. Um, very good question here um, from Iona Horton. Um, our clients have an allocation to emerging market stocks, and China is obviously included in that. Given China's ambitions, along with its growing status in the world economy and recent tensions with the US, um, Ina wants to know whether we should feel a little nervous about investing in there. Well, I'm, I'm glad to have a question about China. Uh, because it's definitely something that, that I spend a lot of time thinking about and my team spends a lot of time researching uh, equity strategies in China's market. Um, China represents a really interesting opportunity right now. Uh, and, and it's not necessarily the most popular market uh, given, uh, you know, certainly in the U.S., the, the tensions between the U.S. and China in terms of trade and in terms of all sorts of other issues. Um, but the, the fact remains that China is quickly growing as an economy. Um, within the next 10 years, it's going to be the biggest economy on the planet. So extremely fast growth. Um, China is a market that creates a huge opportunity for diversification. If you look at the way that China's market uh, behaves relative to other global markets, you find that it can be incredibly risk reducing to add China to your portfolio because it just doesn't tend to move in the same direction as developed markets. It's got a, you know, sort of a highly segmented market base. Uh, and the reason for that is that most of the trading that happens in China's market, and this is the other, uh, the, the other basis for the, the opportunity in China, most of the trading is done by individual investors. So if you look at who's trading stocks in New York, mostly you're looking at hedge funds and sophisticated prop traders at investment banks. But in China, 90% of the trading is done by individual investors, non-professionals that don't have uh, any real uh, financial education to speak of. Um, and, and so when we think about behavioral mistakes, uh, you're going to see lots more mispricing in China's market than you do in developed markets. So, uh, you know, in terms of both uh, the economy's growth and diversification benefits, but also in terms of the opportunity to outperform, uh, it, it's, a, it's a really attractive opportunity. Now, 
there are also challenges to investing in China. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, when we think about how even institutional asset owners approach China, uh, they're somewhat cautious, you know, for, for a big pension plan, there's a lot of headline risk investing in China. Um, there are issues with respect to financial reporting and the integrity of what's in companies' financial statements. There are problems with corporate governance in China. State ownership is obviously a big issue. And so all of these things, uh, they lead investors to heavily discount China. And so they're not willing to pay as high price for Chinese stocks as they otherwise would. Uh, again, you know, we sort of view it as an opportunity for investors that are capable of figuring out who the bad actors are. So which companies are manipulating their financial statements, which companies have good governance, uh, which state-owned firms are actually you know, misaligned with shareholders and destroying shareholder value. Uh, and we've sunk a lot of resources into researching China's market so that our models are designed to make those sorts of distinctions. Um, ESG is another issue where uh, you know, in most developing economies, this is not something that firms are particularly worried about. But it turns out in China, we've got lots of good data on ESG. It's, it's mandatory that companies disclose on ESG. Um, and we're able, through other sources, to kind of independently verify the numbers that companies are reporting. And so ESG turns out, for someone who knows China's market well, it's something that we can actually implement in China so that we can avoid investing in companies um, you know, that depending on your preferences and your values might be objectionable. So, um, you know, I think the bottom line for China is that it's a massive opportunity, but you've got to take uh, special care when evaluating investments in China. And uh, really, it's important to note, uh, as I said, we've invested a lot in studying China's market, and we've actually got a team of researchers on the ground in China that study China and other East Asian emerging markets. And so uh, Henderson Rose clients that are invested in EM um, are in good hands with respect to the research resources that we have to make these types of distinctions and find the true value in China and avoid all these risks. Um, thanks very much, Phil. Can you um, just briefly sort of uh, say why it's important to have sort of boots on the ground um, for the research team in China? Yeah, of course. So. When it comes to emerging markets, um, you know, developed markets, if you look at the UK versus the US versus Germany, they tend to be really similar in terms of accounting standards. So even the differences between US GAAP accounting and international financial reporting standards, um, they're not so great. Uh, and when you look at regulations and when you look at market structure and the way stocks trade, it's pretty similar across developed markets. But if you start looking at emerging markets, what you find is that all of these markets, they're trying to converge to where developed markets are, but they all started at different places and they're taking different paths uh, to get there. And so emerging markets tend to be extremely unique in terms of things like financial reporting, um, the way that securities markets and financial markets are regulated. Um, in, in China, there are big differences in terms of the way that stocks trade. You'll find uh, frequent trading suspensions, there are price limits that dictate how much a stock can go up or down in a given day. And all of these things, uh, you know, they can sort of undermine traditional ways of investing. When you try to apply a strategy that worked in the U.S. and you take that strategy, try to apply it in China, um, very often the strategy will either break down or it won't work nearly as well as it could if you were to tailor that strategy to these unique features of China's market. And so having researchers on the ground in China not only allows us to sort of tap into the information flow about companies in China, um, but it gives us a better perspective on all these unique features. And then we can build a strategy that incorporates those features um, to, to fully extract the mispricing that you get when 90% of the trading is done by amateur investors. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, that was very useful. Um, and finally, um, several clients have picked up on the fact that the Bank of England has recently asked UK banks how prepared their systems are should they want to implement negative interest rates. And there's been speculation that we could see negative uh, rates by the spring. This is clearly bad news for savers, but as investors, could we see some positives from this? So, I, I mean, I guess the 
the, the principal positives are, are sort of on the theoretical side. So theoretically, the reason that a central bank would want uh, negative rates is that it discourages oversaving. Uh, so it gets people out spending money. Um, it gets banks to lend money. It gets companies to borrow money. So, you know, in, in terms of a stimulus, it's, you know, it's sort of an extreme form of stimulus. And the hope is that, uh, you know, when we're facing something like COVID-19, uh, that that's going to keep the economy going until the crisis is over with. Um, now, there are some other positives potentially. So uh, certainly prime properties would be expected to get a bump in price with, with negative rates. Um, you know, for uh, governments that are running substantial deficits, negative rates are great because it means they can raise money at a lower cost of capital. Uh, th there are a lot of negative effects. So uh, clearly it's not great for savers. Um, there are some sort of, you know, less, uh, less significant negative implications. Um, I think banks with negative rates, you, you might start to see cash holding fees on your account statement. Um, uh, you know, for uh, some investors, they might wind up instead of spending money, they might actually put cash in the mattress. That's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, and then more significant negative effects. Uh, pension plans are certainly worried about this because if they can't hit their target rate of return, uh, then they're going to have to cut benefits, which is not great for the beneficiaries, obviously. For Henderson Row clients, so uh, the, this issue, the, the negative for savers is the biggest problem. Uh, and it affects investors. So, so clients that have fixed income in their portfolio, clearly it changes the way that you look at that part of the portfolio. Um, in a different environment where rates are higher, you could look at the fixed income as a source of return. Uh, now, I think we tend to look at fixed income. If we have negative rates, certainly, we would look at it more as a way to calibrate the risk of the portfolio. So uh, if you want less volatility, uh, if you want more security in the portfolio, you would put more into bonds, but, but you wouldn't necessarily expect much yield. The other thing, uh, and again, this gets back to security selection, is that when rates are that low, investors still want some yield, they start to, to look to other places to find yield. So, um, you know, I mentioned stocks are, uh, trading at big discounts in the UK, and that means there are going to be plenty of stocks with high dividend yields. Now, uh, it's easy for companies to suspend dividend payments, and you might find that chasing a high dividend yield, you wind up not getting a dividend, and instead you experience capital losses. So looking at the quality of companies that, uh, that, that trade at a high dividend yield, that's critically important. On the fixed income side, some investors are trying to uh, cope with low rates and potentially negative rates by moving to high yield uh, fixed income. But the, the important thing to recognize there is that we haven't yet seen the full financial implications of COVID. It's clear that the longer the pandemic drags on, the higher we expect default rates on high yield to go. Um, and so again, the quality of the issuer becomes really important when you start to kind of stretch in terms of risk to get that extra return. Um, so, you know, it's certainly a challenge for investors um, and, and, you know, our, our models are, are basically designed to try to separate the good and the bad as we uh, try to extend uh, and get that higher risk adjusted return. Uh, excellent. Thanks very much, Phil. And was it is still sort of speculation this time and we've seen uh, endless speculation on where rates will go um, over the years. So we um, going forward. Um, very good. Well, um, I think we finished um, in sort of good time today. Um, Phil, thanks very much for, for joining us and for giving us uh, the benefit of your wisdom. Um, I hope you stay sane in the US over the next um, sort of 11 days. Um, uh, wish you all the best of that. Um, and then um, to everyone else, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, sadly, it's not... Um, uh, as exciting as, as sort of talking to everyone uh, live and, and enjoying kind of nice food and uh, sort of drink afterwards. Um, but um, we look forward to when we can do that uh, again very soon. Um, so I think you've all got time to make a cup of tea and uh, maybe a glass of something stronger um, for your next uh, sort of appointment. Um, and um, it's goodbye for me and look forward to speaking to you all very soon. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.